big fan of this opening with the drunk camera operator listing around and falling in and out of focus. That, together with the muffled sound, lets us know it's a flashback slash dream. And it starts reintroducing the mystery that made the first film fun. He was just a little tyke when they recruited him? Ooh, and Baby Driver has me in the mood for scene transitions, and that was a sweet one. And similarly to the first one, right back into the action. No time for sleep, no time for explanation. It's something that makes these films intriguing. We're just constantly along for the ride with these confused kids. You kids doing all right? Yeah, you should totally trust him. He rarely betrays people. Poor Aiden Gillen. No one will ever not suspect him of being little fingery. It's not like he doesn't give us reason to doubt him. I mean, you're taking us home? A home of sorts. If you consider having blue stuff sucked out of your brain while you're in a medical-induced coma, then yeah, sounds pretty homey to me. A bit of a reprieve where everyone can take a breath, but Thomas shows us clearly the toll the maze and losing Chuck had on him. Yup, this kid's a maze runner. Confirmed. I like how the guard comes into frame with just his gun and a focal point, since that's all Thomas really sees. Which side are you on? I remember watching my friends die in front of me. I'm on their side. And then Dylan O'Brien reminds me why he's rising to the top right now. Soon you'll all be moving on to greener pastures. Isn't that what you say about an animal when it dies? I guess he wasn't lying. Where are they going? Some kind of farm. Again, guys, a farm? The same farm where everyone's elderly dogs go? You guys are more gullible than the residents of the island. But at least they had an excuse. I know. After some wins like this, a few of you have headed to the comments to tell me that these are actually sins. But you're missing the point. What makes it a win is that the characters are hinting to the audience at what is going on while still pulling the wool over the kids' eyes. Who, for the record, would be so happy to be out of the maze would believe just about anything. Teresa! Hey, hey, hey. Good old Thomas already breaking rules and challenging authority. Consistent character win. I can get used to this. Would have been better off too. Back into the maze. But it's almost like being at home with Thomas. And if you really think about it, they've been slowly working them all back into a maze from the time they landed. Big open receiving area to smaller medical area to smaller cafeteria to smaller bunk room with a locked door. I don't know. This is as far as we've ever gotten. Vince didn't even go into that section. That actually makes sense. A medical lab that consists of clean rooms wouldn't want to share air with the rest of the facility. They've seen Outbreak? They actually set up this little John McClane vent crawl pretty well since Eris... Wait, that's really his name? Eris. Eris? Like Cloud's girlfriend? Anyway, Eris watched Thomas try to get through security, so he knows Thomas is a suspicious dude. Eris said they bring in a new batch every night. Who the hell is Eris? Tim. Oh. I'm so. And <laughs> I love that everyone just sort of picked up where they left off, knowing Thomas is gonna get someone killed. No, of course I didn't. Yeah, I'd buy that. He kind of reached over his shoulder. I don't know if this is makeup or not, but got some attention to detail with Thomas's elbows all beat up after crawling through the ductwork. Baby Grievers. They won't feel a thing. Oh, little finger, these are your roles. Much better than trying out Smart Bane. I can almost feel people's brains saying, wait, how did they get back into the vents? Well, what you do is you have Eris sit on Thomas's shoulders and then have Eris pull Thomas up once he's up there, or vice versa. But that would kill the flow and tension of the scene. It's right around and talk to us. It's what it did. It's still wicked. It's, it's always been wicked. And that's terrifying. Sense chills up my spine even though I already know. Like a Twilight Zone episode where you realize you're so trapped. It happens quick for us, but the delivery of that line to the rest of the kids would be devastating. Any sense of relief immediately vanishes and is replaced with anguish. I like this little moment when the mattress in front of the window alerts Jansen that something is awry. Ugh, and that command just by lack of expression. That's how in charge this dude is. What the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Also a fun character growth moment for Mino, who ran the first time he was confronted with danger. Fun fact, our director, the ex-visual effects guy that he is, added the poor doctor wetting himself. Yeah, let me guess, Wicked is good? You're not getting through that door, Thomas. There he is. Once the cat's out of the bag, Peter Baelish starts getting real. Ooh, wouldn't be a Maze Runner movie without a narrow escape from crushing by closing door. But less icky terror this time and more, yeah. <clears throat> so we're, we're sure about this? 100% sure we want to go out into the storm? One of the fun things you'll notice on a second viewing of this film are the number of times Teresa gives a tell that she knows more than she's letting on or that she's unsure where her allegiances lie. Like when Thomas is talking about the kids being drained, she touches the implant slash tattoo on the back of her neck. Not really sure which it is, but whatever Wicked did to her. One thing that I mentioned in the first film was the use of natural lighting, and Scorch Trials continues that, often only using flashlights and lanterns to light characters' faces that again makes this world feel so real and run down. Ooh, liking that little homage to all the boys standing in front of the maze in the first movie and now standing in front of the proverbial Scorch before them. 
This slow burn gathering supplies scene is super stressful and drags out our expectations. You know something's coming, but what and when? Is it going to be normal people still living there for a little Walking Dead type drama? Or are they all cranks now for some other Walking Dead type drama? A really great example of show don't tell. Teresa sees the picture of the girl with the stuffed animal, wonders aloud, and then we see the teddy bear inside the cage. And stuffed animals? You have me wondering if there may be some other, other Walking Dead type drama coming. Alright, that's enough Walking Dead. And then the action appropriately kicks back in since turning on the power would definitely alert all the cranks. And I have to say I don't hate the crank screech. It gives them an otherworldly sound design. And having the cranks split them up ramps the tension like they're back in the maze. <laughs> Saving Newton is a super satisfying way. Who doesn't want to kick a vine zombie through glass off a second story mall? I like that Thomas's runner status is so well established that there's no doubt he can outrun the cranks and escape, so we fade to some auditorily pleasing silence. This run-down city is visually my favorite part of the film. The detail and insane amount of destruction is depicted expertly, especially contrasted against the superior and futuristic Wicked tech. Winston! Hey! Winston! Again, we're presented with the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, just by the look on Thomas's face. However, this time he's in charge, so no exceptions. I don't like sand. It's cars and it's robbing, irritating, cats everywhere. Cranks are bad. Wicked is good, I mean bad. But really, my main concern for these kids is skin cancer. Anyone carrying any sunscreen? Ooh, that musical cue. Blade Runner meets... Uh, something I can't place. Like Tron Legacy or something. Everything was fine until you... Nothing. Wow, what a tell. She's totally on Wicked's side at this point. Everything was fine until you gave the right arm Wicked's facility locations. Nope, nope, n nope, n no thanks. Right, new. And I get why Thomas would want to drag Winston to the end of the earth. He wants to save everyone. In this look, Dylan O'Brien takes all the culpability onto his shoulders with that one look and apology. Hmm, some evenly spaced single file marching and then an in unison freeze. It's the little things that give me joy. All right, this is a close runner up for favorite aesthetic in this movie. Lightning storms in the real world are scary. Throw about 500% more electricity flying through the air and you've got young adult fiction. Also, I know there's no actual rain, but this is clearly a storm, so there's your rainy glade day from the first film. Ah, oh, that's it. Get Thomas some headphones and an iPod. Tinnitus ringing from here on out. If you got struck by lightning. Oh. Mino's alive. Also cool headedness. Now that's an entrance. Crank jump scare domino effect entrance. And when I start to get a bad feeling about this place. No feelings were harmed in the making of this scene. How can I profit? You see, what you need is some kind of legitimate front, and then you get someone to make the blue stuff, then profit. You came from Wicked. I love how much Giancarlo Esposito clearly loves this role. All right, these Wicked high-tech soldiers are pretty sweet. Or are they mercenaries? Contractors? What's the preferred nomenclature for a non-governmental combatant? One, two, three, yeah. Yeah. Teamwork! <laughs> Saving your new f kids who are potentially valuable to the right arm. Come on, hurry! We're running out of time! Ha! <laughs> you think that's just one of those annoying cliché lines, but they are actually running out of time. So it's not technically a cliché dodge, more of a meta-cliché. And that's one of the most satisfying chain reaction collapsing buildings ever. You ask a lot of questions. It's kind of his thing. Yeah, peace out. The other direction looks cool. I said peace out. Ah, nope, nobody, nope, nope. No, sir. Nah, no, sir. This is definitely one of the most inventive chase scenes. Trying to scale the building that's leaning at a 45. Never knowing what's going to give way or fall on you. And I know some people were disappointed by the switch to CGI cranks, but the later stages of the flare definitely lend themselves to CGI. And they do some pretty inhuman feats. No, friend, don't move! Don't move! No, no, go ahead, move. Put all your weight on one foot. I should send this stupidity. But not everyone knows how to react when standing on spiderweb and glass over a 200 foot drop. Least of all, cranks. <laughs> nice quick thinking. Raza Ghoul would be proud. Drink it! Greasy, slimy, eyeliner wearing Alan Tudyk is always a win. <laughs> that was fun! That sounds like the opinion of King Candy. You're not her. Ouch. 
I'm still not calling this a love triangle, she's just inebriated. However, what I will say is that this little Land of the Lotus Eater sequence scored by a remix of Motorcycles as the Rush comes is probably my favorite auditory section of the film. Although the wavy camera filter and smoky lighting don't hurt in visually explaining how high Thomas is. Whatever they say, I just need you to know I had to do it, okay? What did you do? Even way back here, we're shown that there was a clear dividing line between Teresa and Thomas. Even way before the maze, she had her doubts. Later, Wicked comes in. They separate the wheat from the chaff. See, this is what I'm talking about, Jorge. He could be your Heisenberg. Sorry, lost. Everybody, get set to sprint back to the truck and hold your ears. Chekhov's bomb may be a terrible plan. Just off the top of my head, your friends are in front of you, rock slides, more tinnitus, but still, Chekhov's bomb. Hey, so that makes three Game of Thronesians. Games of Thronians. Game of Throners. But I'd go easy, Eris. Grey Worm's no one to mess with. Just have to point out that this is why you don't let kids be the ones who decide who gets let into your camp based on old maze friendships. Point is, I like that she's hobbling around all sick looking even when she's not the focus of the scene. Barry Pepper, the old Bible quote and sniper who also went up against Travolta and his Cyclo-Scientologists. Hello, Thomas. Even when Lily Taylor is acting happy, I still see her as John Cusack's super depressed ex-girlfriend. Anyone else? You gave me the coordinates of every wicked compound, trial, and lab. What a moment for Thomas, learning that you were actually the hero. And the look on his friend's faces gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. He was my brother. You remind me of him. See, no love triangle here, except a Luke Leia kind of one. And that, who, who would do that? He was my brother. What was his name? George. Aw, you mean this George? And based on the fact that there seemed to be only one immune kid per first name, aw. Hugging. Okay. I guess I owe you now. Just make like a daring truck-related rescue so I don't have to kill myself and all my friends and we'll be good. Do you remember your mother? I remember mine. The visions were gone. She'd taken care of them. She took her eyes out, Thomas. We can't turn our backs on them. Please don't fight them, Thomas. And as much as it's angering that Teresa did this and a total gut punch betrayal twist, it's not difficult to empathize with her motivations. The story of her mother was enough, but this movie has been leading to this and right in the previous scene, she made her decision. Also, what a beautiful shot of dusk in the background that marks the turning point from happy relieving day to the terrible night that's about to come. and Paisano punctuates the moment with this amazing crescendoing score. Last action set piece is crazy chaotic and gives our crew a chance to fight in new ways. A good evolution from Pointy Sticks. Don't worry, Barry. You'll get your chance. I'm tired of running. Then you might be in the wrong franchise, buddy. It could just be her sterile doctor lab coat persona, but the fact that Ava is always wearing white makes me think she's either a super villain, which her intentions don't make me think that, or it's being hinted that she's actually doing the right thing. We're with you, Thomas. As insane and dumb as this move is, solidarity like this gets me right in the feels. Aquila to the rescue! Come on, guys, you didn't forget he was in the Jungle Book, did ya? Ooh, that's like a quick draw anti-stormtrooper brain. Man, whoever is responsible for the case ejection sound effect deserves a freaking Oscar. Let's listen again. <laughs> That's good guy. I'm so glad Barry Pepper was given this moment. <laughs> Mina better turn into the Electro Runner or something. That's the third time he's been electrocuted in like 48 hours. Wait, is, is this the origin story for Dynamo? Remember when Arnold spared him in the crowd booed? Ah, the future. You're terrible. Which, by the way, is supposed to take place next year. I made a promise to Mina. I wouldn't leave him behind. I have to go after him. And the most predictable and occasionally irritating thing about Thomas is also the most redeemable. He wants everybody to make it. Or, well, nobody. But that's his thing. When everyone else knows it's the wrong move, he pushes on anyway. And there's something mythic and empowering about that. It's a good speech, kid. So what's your plan? Yeah, Thomas doesn't really do plans. I haven't read the books. I don't know if I said that in my first video. I might after I see the third movie, but not before. And hear me out. Since, I think... Ender's Game, I made a decision that I'd always watch the movie first. The reason is that 99 out of 100 times, the book is going to be better. So why ruin the movie? I know I'll enjoy the book after. Anyway, I've gathered through research that this movie departs from the book in some serious ways. So it seems like in this case, you have to read the books to understand doesn't apply. But I didn't find the plot as confusing as some people. I'll admit there are some overall world elements that are a tad, I don't know, underdeveloped. 
but honestly that's almost a staple of young adult fiction. The practicality of forcing children into a battle royale every year to keep your citizens in line? Splitting your entire society into factions based on a Myers-Briggs personality test? Trapping kids in a giant maze as a test to somehow make a cure for plant zombieism? It's all pretty much the same and a level of suspension of disbelief you need to accept in order to consume this type of story. Point is, none of that pulls me out of the movie. Because it's the characters and their interpersonal stories that matter. The decisions they make and why they make them and whether I buy that they'd make those decisions. And for the most part, I generally do buy it. Is Thomas threatening to blow himself and his friends up to prevent having his blood used to find a cure for a global disease dumb, selfish, and not thought out? A at all? Yes. Do I believe he'd do that? Absolutely. I'm tired of running. Thomas is a man-boy of action. His defining character trait is jumping without looking. And while he left the Glade leading the group, no one said he was the best leader. He's still leaping blindly. And in this film, that has consequences. Serious consequences. Ones that Teresa isn't willing to endure. And she is my favorite character to watch through the whole movie. We find out at the end of the first act that she got her memories back and she makes it clear throughout that she's second guessing leaving Wicked. You end up hating her but sympathizing with her motivations by the end. Deaths like Winston's are what Wicked claims to be trying to prevent. So yeah, she judges Go 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 Thomas for it. But by the end they're all fed up and each of them thinks they're doing the right thing. And at this point, I, I don't know. Making predictions about a movie based on a book that's already written seems silly but since the movies have departed so much from the books, whatever. I think Wicked might be good. I think in the end we'll find out that they were doing the right thing, just maybe not as humanely as we'd like. I can't see a way around it right now. It'll probably come out that they also created the flare, so not good, but we'll just have to see. I just enjoy that this film is still making me think about it. For a lot of the runtime, it was sort of a fast zombie zombie movie, which I was fine with. It worked for the tension they'd built about the Scorch. Compared to the first film, it's like we went from platformer to sandbox. Haha, <laughs> get it? Cause sand. Anyway, after the confining spaces and imminent crushings of the Maze Runner, it's the vast wasteland desert that's the biggest threat in a large part of this film. It can be unrelenting at times and feel a little lather, rinse, repeat, but it's what these kids are going through and it really sells their desperation by the time Thomas is ready to blow them all up. I pointed out a few of the instances, but one little motif this movie is a fan of is ending a perilous scene while the characters are still in imminent danger and then cutting to them being safe. It works for the tension, but also can feel like a cheat at times. One other little touch that was brought to mind and then West Ball actually confirmed was the feeling of using sound and music as a character. It's a storytelling device more than in the last film. They approach the doors to exit the facility, the music peaks, and then the sound of the storm takes over. Then the opposite happens when the sandstorm picks up in the scorch, and then cuts to the calm of them taking a break. Fun, clever, rhyming moments like that are what I enjoy in movies. Honestly, overall, this film is well made. It has plenty of compelling action, and like I said, the characters are interesting, and the performances are killer. Esposito and O'Brien standing out the most. The confusion in the story can easily be chalked up to the sheer difficulty of trying to adapt a middle book in a series. From what I understand, they took elements from the last book as well to try to make a more standalone story. I can't say how Death Cure is gonna do. They definitely have an uphill battle. The young adult movie ship has sorta of sailed at this point, and the gap between this and the last film isn't gonna help anything. My one hope is that Dylan O'Brien and West Ball's careers aren't tainted because of it. They both clearly have a lot to offer still. Next week, yes, you guessed. Rejoice, and people who hate the series despair. But also rejoice, because we're almost done. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Let be, Armando. I'm sorry, Armando. Don't worry, Armando. I changed my mind, Armando.